I am beginning now to read a new book. It is in the form of a, of a PDF file that is that was sent to me, which I have now in my uh, Google Documents, and I can send to others if they so desire. And uh, I want to read it and let you know that as I read it, I'm reading it for the first time. And uh, I don't know much about the Rosicrucians. This book is called The Rosicrucians and Their Secret Doctrine. But right off the bat, I want to say secret societies like the Rosicrucians and the Freemasonry, I've heard so much fear-mongering concerning them. And I don't get a whole lot from the fear-mongering about anything really terrible they do. They do only this symbol or that symbol is so terrible, you know, and their symbols are everywhere like a symbol as something that is sinister. And I think, well, do you mean as sinister as the symbol of the uh, the Nazi Germany swastika symbol? Because if you do, I don't agree. Because the, the swastika was more ancient than the uh, Nazis were. And its meaning had great power. It was, it was represented the eternal motion of the cosmos. And probably that's why they picked that symbol, because they wanted to represent something so forceful. Also in some parts of the land, uh, the, the swastika represents good luck. And, and we've let the swastika be something that we look at and fear, or we look at and denounce, oh, this is bad. And we've just let them take away from us people of long ago who used this, this symbol for a bad purpose. We've let them take away from us the use of it altogether because now if you show a swastika anywhere, people are going to look at you like you're some horrible person. And it's like we voluntarily let it continue to mean what the Nazi Germany um, Hitler regime wanted it to mean, and it doesn't, they stole it. We can take it back, but the thing is people don't want to take it back because they can't let go of the meaning that Hitler gave to that symbol, and they need to let it go because it's more ancient than Hitler, and it had a good meaning. And I would love to see the day come when it could be a symbol that we put out in the public and that people don't feel afraid of. After all, understanding something, as I'm hoping to understand the Rosicrucians when I read this, understanding would take away all the fear and suspicion. And when there's fear and suspicion, the imagination just runs wild and makes up all kinds of horrible thoughts, many of which probably are not true. And I think I'm going to find that out about the Rosicrucians because I've always wondered about them. And... Now I have the opportunity to read this book, and I'll be reading it to you as well, and we can both together understand, and if anyone wants to make a comment, they're welcome to, but I would sure hope that nobody would start making comments that they're awful with until they understand who the Rosicrucians are. I think possibly they're not awful, that they're probably pretty wonderful people. But we're going to find out, because I'm going to read this, and you will hear it. And I begin now. The Rosicrucians and Their Secret Doctrine, Part 1. The student of the history of occultism and the esoteric teachings, and even the average reader of current books and magazines, finds many references to the Rosicrucians, a supposed ancient secret society devoted to the study of occult doctrines and the manifestation of occult powers. But when such person seeks to obtain detailed information concerning this supposed ancient order, he finds himself baffled and defeated. Before acknowledging the futility of the quest, however, he usually investigates one or more so-called orders, having as a part of their title the word Rosicrucians, only to find himself invited to join such order 
upon the payment of a fee or fees ranging from a small amount in some cases to quite large amounts in others, each order claiming to be the only original order and asserting that all the others are base imitators. The truth is that there is not in existence and never has been in existence any popular occult order sanctioned by the real Rosicrucians, which any one may join upon payment of fees, large or small, just as he may join any of the better known fraternal organizations of which there are so many. The true Rosicrucians have no formal organization and are held together only by the ties of common interests in the occult and esoteric studies and by the common acceptance of certain fundamental principles of belief and knowledge. This unorganized order has members in all walks of life and in all countries, and its members never announce themselves as Rosicrucians to the general public. Admission to this unorganized order is never granted upon the payment of a fee and is possible only upon the request and recommendation of three members in good standing who have themselves been members for a certain period of time and who have attained certain degrees of proficiency in the attainment of the esoteric knowledge and in demonstrating the principles discovered by them under the direction of certain higher adepts in the arcane wisdom. Members of the Rosicrucian body are prominent in the councils of nearly all of the occult organizations and societies throughout the world. In fact, it is these persons who are the real leaven in the general mass and who keep alive the sacred flame of truth in them. Many Rosicrucians are also prominent in philosophic and scientific circles and some of them are men quite prominent in the large affairs of the business and professional world and in the ranks of statesmanship. Others are prominent in movements like the labor movement and similar activities. Some are prominent in the councils of the various churches and others are leaders in masonry and similar secret societies. In all of such circles, the Rosicrucians exert a powerful influence and always in the direction of good. The Brothers of the Rosy Cross the modern interest in the Rosicrucian teachings dates back to the early part of the 17th century, about 1610 to be exact. At that time, there were rumors of the existence of a society known as the Brothers of the Rosy Cross, the officers and meeting places of which were not known to the public. The mysterious society was severely attacked by the ecclesiastical authorities and others and was as vigorously defended by those who were interested in the general subject of occultism and esoteric teachings. There were many spurious and counterfeit orders established during the following century, and for that matter in ne nearly every century since, but none have been able to show an undoubted connection with the original order. Some of the original teachings of the Rosicrucians have been incorporated in some of the higher degrees of masonry and have served a good purpose therein. The legend concerning the origin of the order, true in some respects but erroneous in others, was as follows. That a certain Christian Rosicruitz, a German nobleman, who had donned the robes of a certain order of monks, had visited India, Persia, and also Arabia, and had returned bringing with him a certain secret doctrine obtained from the sages and seers of those oriental lands. He was said to have established the original Rosicrucian Brotherhood about 1425, its existence not becoming generally known until nearly 200 years afterwards. The true Rosicrucians, however, recognized this legendary tale as being merely a cleverly disguised recital of the real facts of the establishment of the unorganized order, which must be read between the lines, aided by the spectacles of understanding, in order that its real import may be grasped. The present writer does not feel justified in telling in these pages the tale as he understands it and as it has been transmitted to him by those in authority. In fact, 
to make the same public, he would be violating a most sacred promise, which would amount to a betrayal of his initiation secrets. He, however, is permitted to state that the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians is a body of esoteric teachings handed down for ages by wise men deeply versed in the esoteric doctrines and occult lore. This wisdom originally came by way of the Orient, and in fact even today comprises part of the inner teachings of some of the highest Oriental brotherhoods. In its history is but another instance of the truth of the old secret axioms, one of which says that we must look to the east whence comes all light. For many years, little or nothing was permitted to be revealed to the general public concerning the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians. But during the past 25 years, there has been a greater and still greater freedom in this respect. Until today, many important Rosicrucian teachings form a part of nearly all writings and teachings upon the subject of the esotericism in general and of the higher metaphysic physics in particular. Theosophy and the general interest in Oriental philosophies and religions have done much to bring into public notice some of the more elementary points of the secret doctrine. In fact, in the highest writings and teachings of some of the great organizations above referred to, the Rosicrucians may find many half-hidden bits of the Rosicrucian doctrine, cleverly, cleverly disguised from the unprepared many, yet plainly revealed to the prepared few. The Higher Alchemy the Rosicrucians, according to the public encyclopedia and other works of reference, are held to have been devoted to the subject of alchemy. And, indeed, this statement is correct. But the modern compilers of such reference books have fallen into the era of supposing that the alchemy referred to was performed wholly upon the plane of matter and concerned wholly with the transmutation of elements. They are ignorant of the fact that the alchemy which attracted the Rosicrucians and which took up most of their time and attention was mental alchemy and spiritual alchemy, something quite different indeed, though having a course of correspondence to the material alchemy according to the law of correspondence. The student of the present book will discover this fact and will, will receive many valuable hints concerning the higher forms of alchemy provided he is prepared to read between the lines of the text and to reason by analogy. The axiom, as above, so below, will be found to work out well in this connection. Why the esoteric teaching is kept secret. It is difficult to convey to the average European or American the true reasons underlying the secrecy which invariably surrounds the esoteric teachings of all the great schools of occult thought. Such a person is inclined to think that the only reason, therefore, is the delight in mystery-mongering, which he thinks he finds among all occult teachers. But to one who penetrates even but a short distance on the path, the true reasons are perceived. Such a one perceives the dangers of premature disclosure of important esoteric principles to the unprepared public mind. The following quotation from a well-known writer will perhaps give a hint to the solution of this question. The writer says, The Oriental method of cultivating, cultivating knowledge has always been differed diametrically from that pursued in the West during the growth of modern science. Whilst Europe has investigated nature as publicly as possible, every step being discussed with the utmost freedom, and every fresh fact acquired circulated at once for the benefit of all, Asiatic science has been studied secretly and its conquest jealously guarded. I need not as yet attempt either criticism or defense of its method. The student will later on see that this falls naturally into its place in the whole scheme of occult philosophy. The approaches to this philosophy have always been open, in one sense, to all. Vaguely throughout the world in various ways have been diffused the idea that some process of study 
which men here and there did actually follow, might lead to, to the acquisition of a higher kind of knowledge than that taught to mankind at large in books or by public teachers. The East, as pointed out, has always been more than vaguely impressed with this belief, but even in the West, the whole block of symbolical literature relating to astrology, alchemy, and mysticism generally has fermented in European society, carrying to some peculiar, receptive, and qualified minds the conviction that behind all this superficially meaningless nonsense, great truths lay concealed. For such persons, eccentric study has sometimes revealed hidden passages regarding, no, leading to the grandest imaginable realms of enlightenment. But till now, in all such cases, in accordance with the law of those schools, the neotype no sooner forced his way into the region of mystery than he was bound over to the most involatile secrecy as to everything connected with his entrance and further progress there. In Asia, in the same way, the chila, or pupil of occultism, no sooner became a chila than he ceased to be a witness on behalf of the reality of occult knowledge. I have been astonished to find, since my own connection with the subject, how numerous such chilas are, but it is impossible to imagine any human act more improbable than the unauthorized revelation by any such chila to persons of the outer world, that he is one. And so the great esoteric school of philosophy successfully guards its seclusion. It is, however, desirable to disabuse the reader of one conception in regard to the objects of the date of adeptship that he very likely has formed, the development of those spiritual faculties whose culture has to do with the highest objects of the occult life, gives rise to a, as it progresses to a great deal of incidental knowledge having to do with physical laws of nature not yet generally understood. This knowledge and the practical art of manipulating certain obscure forces of nature, which it brings in its train, invest an adept and even an adept's pupils at a comparatively early stage of their education with very extraordinary powers the application of which to matters of daily life will sometimes produce results that seem altogether miraculous. And from the ordinary point of view, the acquisition of apparently miraculous power is such a stupendous achievement that people are sometimes apt to fancy that the adept's object in seeking the knowledge he attains has been to invest himself with these coveted powers. It would be as reasonable to say of any great patriot of military history that his object in becoming a soldier has been to wear a gay uniform and impress the imagination of the nursemaids. The Secret Doctrine of the Rosicrucians, and I will begin that in the second video of this.